And, uh, you know, there's always been that long story about Michael Jordan didn't want Isaiah Thomas on the Dream Team. And uh, Isaiah Thomas, as we found in the documentary, there were a lot of people that didn't like the Pistons style of basketball or Isaiah Thomas. Uh, Jack McCollum, legendary NBA guy for 30 years, covered it, uh, said, no, 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 Michael, Michael did not want Isaiah Thomas on the team, and that's that. Here it is. No matter what you heard, there was never much of a chance for Isaiah Thomas to make the dream team. For this reason mainly, Michael Jordan did not want him. I wrote that back in 1992 because a source close to the situation, no, not Jordan himself, told me that was the case. But Jordan's reaction to the question, did you keep Isaiah off the team, was either angry, no, dismissive, no Isaiah questions, please, or coy, hey, I didn't pick the team. So when I went to interview Jordan for the Dream Team book in 2011, I wondered how I would nudge the conversation over to Isaiah Thomas. But against all odds, Jordan went there himself, suddenly and without warning. And when they called me to ask me to play, Rob Flynn called me and said, Rob, I won't play with Isaiah Thomas on the team. He assured me, he said, you know what? Chuck that one, Isaiah. So Isaiah's not going to be a part of the team. If you didn't hear, he said, I don't want to play if Isaiah Thomas is on the team. Yeah, so what? So what? LeBron James didn't want certain Lakers on his team two years ago and got him traded. That's not a three-week exhibition. That's the league with a salary cap where you have to find other teams that will take the players. Michael was like, I don't like that guy. We got Stockton. We got Magic. I don't like him. So, so what? <laughs> you have NBA stars now when you have to, in the NBA, to make a trade, you, you, you have to find about three teams where the salaries match up. It's incredibly difficult for a GM when a player's like, James Harden, I don't want Chris Paul here. What do you do? It's hard. They had Stockton Magic. Yeah, I don't like him. He tackled me for four years. I don't like him. Wouldn't shake my hand. So what? Folks, the Olympics was a trip. It wasn't about winning. They were playing Tunisia. They were going to win. The average margin of victory was 40 points. It was a trip. And guys on trips, I can't speak for women, but let me speak for guys. We've all done it. You're putting together a camping trip, trip to Vegas, golfing trip in Ireland, and there's that one guy you're like, yeah, he's weird. I probably wouldn't want to be with him for six days. He's odd. Don't you think he's kind of strange? I've always had a rule with guys. You can't take four guys anywhere for any duration. You can take three, but by the fourth, one guy's got a weird something collection. One guy will fool around. One guy will be inappropriate. One guy doesn't get the joke. You just can't take four guys anywhere. It's the three-guy rule. You go to Vegas, one of them's really cheap. You can't buy a nice bottle of wine. One guy complains about money. One guy wants to go to bed at 745. One guy is rigid. What? Michael didn't like him on the team. By the way, Charles Barkley didn't like him either. And the next year, Charles Barkley won the MVP. So the guys with the talent... MJ and Barkley, at the time, two best guys were like, no, we don't like him. Here you go. Folks, I've had, I've probably known a dozen guys in my life who have started a company, right? Or, or you know, they're, they're, some are tiny. There's four people, eight people. The two things guys look for, one, talent. But a close second and often first is compatibility. It's called hang. Is he a good hang? This was a trip overseas, crammed in buses, seven footers, dinner every night, lunch every day, practice every day. The games were not competitive. Like there was one that was marginally competitive. This was, do you want to hang out with Isaiah Thomas, who'd been part of a Pistons team that tackled people for three years? I mean, tried to hurt people, was petty, wouldn't shake anybody's hand. Sorry, Isaiah, be a better hang. Be a better hang. That's on you. David Robinson was quoted recently talking about this. And David Robinson, uh, we tried to find the quote. Uh, we couldn't find the audio of it yet. But he talked about it. He said, listen, man, it's basketball. Chemistry matters. You got to get along with people. One bad guy blows up a locker room. And, and that's in the NBA where guys go home. 
But when you're going overseas for three and a half weeks, same hotel, same dinner, same buses, same practice, I have no problem if Michael Jordan said, we got Stockton, we got Magic, I don't want him. So what? The rule in life, be compatible. What do I always say? Lubricate, don't agitate society. Why would you go on Twitter and poke, 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 poke? Lubricate life. You're going to get more offers, more job opportunities, make more money, afford better schools for your kids. Everything. Lubricate. Don't agitate. Isaiah was an agitator, and the better player said, see ya, bye, I'm done, and I'm okay with it. There are not a lot of Jack McCallums, and uh, he is joining us via the Coward Global Satellite Network. So, you know, it's funny watching the MJ documentary, Jack. Um, I, I don't know if I learned a lot, but it did amplify what I knew. And there were some little secrets. And listen, I, I love Michael, but he's competitive, Michael Jordan. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes Michael contradicts Michael. So let, let's go back to the Isaiah thing. You have proof that Michael said he's not playing on my team, right? You got proof. Does it bother you? Uh, does it bother me that I have the proof? <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, it bothers me that probably Michael may hear about all this. And I fear he's going to be looking at his laptop one day and go, <laughs> Jack McCallum, <laughs> I have no problem with Jack McCallum. <laughs> no, no. That's, how, that's how I picture Michael answering every question these days, you know. Um, when I went to interview him, the, the tapes are from uh, the book I did in, in 2012, uh, Colin. So when I went to interview Michael, uh, it's obviously one of the things you want to ask him. And he brought it up himself. And he kind of backed into it because the backstory is that during the Olympics qualifying, John Stockton got hurt. And it looked like they might have to replace him. And Michael started talking about that. And he said, man, I thought they were going to get Isaiah to replace him. And I had, then he said, and I had told Rod Thorne in the beginning, I didn't want to play if Michael, if uh, Isaiah was on the team. And it kind of like shocked me. Rarely does your interview go better <laughs> than you think on the tough subject. So, look, there's a whole reason if you want to talk about it. There's a whole couple reasons why I think Michael either avoids it, obfuscates, or kind of downright lies about it. Uh, I have my opinions on that. So. What, what are your opinions? Why, why well, won't he confront it? Well, because um, I think he – it's being presented kind of like Isaiah was a dead, solid lock on the dream team. And Michael came along and went, no, we're kicking him off. He can't be on it. That's not what it was at all. I mean, there was never a lot of locomotion to get Isaiah on the dream team. Um, you know, things happen fast in sports. And that team was basically decided upon May, June, July, August of 91. By that time, the Pistons were no longer the Kings. The Bull, Jordan's Bulls had surpassed them. By that time, Isaiah kind of had acrimonious relationships with a number of players, not just, you know, it's not like, Magic leapt to Mike to leapt to Isaiah's defense. It's not like Chuck Daly, his own coach, yeah. who coached the Dream Team, leapt to his defense. So I think Jordan feels he's out on this kind of island where he alone kept him off. And all I can tell you is that Jordan said he wasn't going to play if Isaiah was on the team. And was that a big contributor? Of course. But there was not a whole chorus of, Okay, this is injustice. We got to get him on the team. That is not the way it was. Not at all. Jack McCallum joining us. You know, there was an interesting quote, um, and it's got its own mythology. I don't believe it that the MJ players today couldn't play with MJ. Um, I just want your perspective. I think players like to win, but Michael is different, and it was a different time. What's your perspective on stars couldn't play with Michael? Well, uh, the 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 uh, sort of let's say. Uh, aggressive behavior that Michael shown toward his teammates what was kind of directed at, uh, I mean, Scotty at it in his time and Scotty, when Michael was doing that, Michael always treated Scotty a little bit like a, a kid brother, 
right. even after Scotty became a dream teamer, you know, one of the one of the 50 greatest players ever. So there was always that sort of big brother, little brother relationship. So if Michael were on a team with LeBron, Durant, Westbrook, Harden, would he treat them a little different? Probably. I think he would still want to be that king of the hill. Um, but in answer to the question, would they have taken the same kind of abuse that Michael gave to B.J. Armstrong, Will Perdue, um, you know, Bill Cartwright? No. <laughs> they, you know, you could ask whether Michael would have doled it out to the superstars. But the way things are today, I believe they would have got a season worth of it and go, eh, I got to be somewhere else, man. You yeah. know, I'm not I'm not hanging around for this. I didn't <laughs> sign up. For this. Right. You know, uh, Jack, you have um, such a unique perspective. I mean, you not only were covering guys, you know, 70s, 80s, but you're still writing today and you're still active. And, you know, there's a lot of LeBron MJ debate talk and I work on a show and a network where we do that stuff. That's what we do. Right. And that's sports. That's sports. That's, that's what it should be. I yeah. you get tired of it. I'm sure you do more than I do, but that's why we do it. You right. Know? Right. LeBron is the great Swiss army knife. I've said that before. He does more things well than anybody I've ever seen. Michael's the greatest individual offensive, defensive, relentless player, but they're both legends. But when you look, go back to when Michael came in and when LeBron came in. Did you know, suspect Michael would be this good? Did you suspect LeBron would be this great? I guess I had my doubts about LeBron. I had more doubts, the way I can recall it. It's a long time ago now, Colin. Um, the way I recall it was I had more doubts about LeBron. I did a story on LeBron when he was a rookie. And at that time, uh, he was coming in, he was changing things around. He was getting rid of his, uh, you know, this sort of scholarly bland brand of old school Cleveland advisors he had. He had a couple lawyers. And, oh, no, I'm going to do my own stuff. I got my guy. You know, I have Maverick. Everything's OK. And I, I got this under control. And I thought I just saw a lot more potential off the court, LeBron's not going to be able to handle this. He hasn't had the Dean Smith mentor like Michael had, hasn't had the stable childhood with Dolores and James the way Michael had. In that respect, LeBron James is one of the most incredible athletes I have ever seen between surpassing what you thought could have happened to him, you know, just as an individual and compared to where he is. I mean, the guy made almost no missteps. None. So yeah. I, from that standpoint, I had many more doubts about LeBron and whatever doubts you had about Michael, he was so good, you know, right away, whether or not the league needed that kind of firing up, whether the right place at the right time, whether his style came along and the league was a little stuffy. I mean, you know, Showtime was going on when Michael came in, but Michael was so good so early that whatever doubts you had were dissipated, you know, right away. Yeah, he's so dynamic. Um, Jack McCallum joining us. When you look at this league now, um, I saw today they're considering going one through 16 seeding and doing it for regardless of conference. I don't think that's ideal, but I'm a big believer in adapt or die. So, Jack, I can't figure something out. I, I theorize a lot. I've got all sorts of theories. Most are ridiculous, but I got a lot of them. Well, theories, you don't have to. That's why they're a theory. They don't have to be correct. <laughs> that's they're why, just a theory. That's why I like them. I can be wrong. So, yeah, exactly. You know. Why has the West for 30 years been so much better? Because I do think reseeding now, regardless of conference, makes more sense because I think the East is less interesting. Is it because the West has better owners? Why has the West been so dominant for 30 years? What is it? I think one of the things, I mean, obviously they should get, I'm not sure there's one out of 10 NBA fans. First thing they could do would get rid of divisions. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Anybody that still puts up their division, well, we're the Atlantic division titleists to me. They could certainly go, I, I, when I look at standings, I just go to conference. And I certainly believe in, uh, you know, believe in reseedings. Uh, so far as better owners, uh, different owners, I would have to really think about that. You know, the West has an amazing brand of 
diverse owners during the time. I mean, they have, you know, you had Jerry Buss, you know, playboy chemist, real estate guy. <laughs> you had uh, Peter Holden, in San Antonio, sort of this close to the vest conservative guy. You had Larry Miller in Utah who sold cars. I mean, they've done it. If it's owners, they have an amazingly diverse bunch of people that have kept these teams uh, near the top. Um, geez, beyond that, Colin, I would have a hard time deciding, you know, what it's been basically since Michael uh, departed from the league. It has been a Western Conference league, but I haven't developed a theory on it yet, but uh, when I do, I will let you know what it is. <laughs> Back to your Dream Team podcast. Jerry Krause was the villain, overwhelmingly. Is that fair, Jack? <sighs> well, no. I mean, I do not see... Uh, I was kind of happy, and I was surprised, that Jerry got that much love. The, the reaction of the first four or five episodes of this podcast was pretty much, you know, largely on why are they crapping on Jerry Krause so bad and he can't defend himself, you know, now that he's he's not with us. And that's valid. I mean, if I write a story about someone who is dead and it's a negative story, yeah, you probably got to pull your punches a little bit because that person is not there to defend themselves. The only thing I will say about Michael and Scotty's sort of almost uh, rabid dog, you know, dogging of Jerry Krause was that this idea of Kukoc and the way Jerry favored Kukoc, that was absolutely true. Because I remember, you know, times during the 91-92 season going to talk to Jerry Krause and all he talked about was Kukoc. And I, I thought that was odd. And Jordan has always had this thing about loyalty. You know, now maybe it had to be loyalty on Jordan's terms. You know, I'm loyalty to Nike. I'm not wearing the Reebok thing, you know. And his thing with Krauss was that this showed some kind of lack of loyalty to talk about this guy who wasn't even on our team, who did not go through these battles with the Pistons and finally win it in 91 so that I want people to remember who thought they were a little hard on Kraus, that that was really true. However, I would give the nod to the documentary going a little bit too heavy on Kraus. I didn't think they needed to show that final press conference at the beginning of maybe episode eight with him walking off the stage and, you know, after he wouldn't answer a question. So it was a little rough on him, but uh, Jerry had his moments when he deserved some criticism. Scotty Pippen was livid reportedly at how he was presented. Did you think the documentary was fair to Scotty? I thought so. I, you know, the, it's interesting about the documentary. There was, uh, 10 hours of documentary and there's been a hundred hours of, you know, a cottage industry of reacting, <laughs> of right. reacting to it. That's kind of what we're doing now. I, I thought Scotty, um, I thought he came across, you know, pretty well. And they had to cover his, uh, the moment when he wouldn't go into the game. Um, and I thought that was Scotty's only bad moment on it. You know that he regrets it. And from the stories that Bill Cartwright told and Steve Kerr told about them breaking down afterward and even Scotty breaking down, Scotty could have used that moment on camera to say, okay, I do regret that. But perhaps he was taking a cue from the whole documentary. Right. It was sort of the no regret tour. You know, right. Michael kind of uh, set the tone. And that was the one moment to me, Scotty came across badly. But that was Scotty himself doing that. So I thought it was kind of fair to him. But I don't know. You know, when you're the subject, when you're the subject of something and when you're in it, I'm sure you've known this. You have probably got criticism that you thought was uh unwarranted and other people thought it was fair. I'm sure that's what Scotty was, but I thought it was okay. Just personally. Okay. They're called the dream team tapes. They're available on iHeartRadio. They're getting all sorts of downloads. I went and checked this morning. It's doing very well. Jack McCallum, sports writer and author in our business, a legend, the podcast, the dream team tapes. And, uh, it's just been a pleasure. And I love that you're still working and kicking it and doing stuff. And your context is invaluable. And I've been reading you for years, Jack. Thank you.
Push it. I want to hear Animal House and the Masters. That's what I can't get out of my mind. You mentioned. Uh, <laughs> I, I totally want to see Green Coats and Animal House. That. <laughs> That I would pay to see. <laughs> <laughs> Great seeing you, Jack. Jack McCallum, good stuff. The Dream Team Tapes.